in the door with AU5. I'm really happy we're all dressed like this. This is, this is fantastic. It is definitely very hot in here, so we'll have to see how that pans out. First off, Merry Christmas, AU5. Merry Christmas to you, man. And you too, Adam. Oh man, Merry Christmas to you. Do they celebrate Christmas in England? Yeah, so I, I, well, I suppose it's technically on the 25th, but I had one of them yesterday. I kind of do different Christmas days with different people. You have a new sample pack. It's called the Free Fall Sample Pack, and it is packed full of so many things. It's through Gravitas. Tell us more about that really quick. All right, so I released a sample pack that contains all of my custom sounds from Free Fall, Emergence, and Shock Diamond, pretty much all of the sounds, uh, all of the songs on my Free Fall EP that I released last year. It has over 200 samples. You have basses, drums, synths, loops, one shots, the original vocal stems from Christina, as well as 20 Ableton instrument racks from the different songs. And there's a lot to work with. I am releasing my longest tutorial yet on how to make the most of a sample pack. And basically what I do is I start creating a song with just the samples from the sample pack. Because oftentimes I hear producers that are that use samples from packs that are just not affected at all from the original sound. And I kind of wanted this to be a tool of inspiration, the tutorial as well as the sample pack, tools of inspiration to create something entirely unique and new from a sample pack, sounds that are sounds that already exist. So I go through a bunch of different creative processing techniques and just my approach to like creating a song um, in the tutorial. So hopefully you enjoy that. Where can people get the sample pack? You can get it on Gravitas Create. And that's also, I have it posted on all of my social media. It should be pretty simple to find. Just to kind of preface, like what got me into doing this project in the first place is this artist in Conti from uh, Zebler and Conti Experience curated this, this compilation album through Gravitas. The whole goal was to make the most psychedelic bass music that that you could i guess and the compilation is super cool it's called infinity mirrors if you haven't already checked that out it's on gravitas it's really cool we have like it has a bunch of bunch of different diverse artists that are just making really trippy bass music and he he came to me and he asked me if i was interested in, in making psychedelic trap as opposed to like side trance um he, he was kind of encouraging people to do something that is more like broken beat and more trappy and stuff and i've never done really either of those things or i never really like my goal was never to really I never set out a goal to make psychedelic trap music and so I just thought like this seems like a really good opportunity for me to just experiment and get weird and go outside of my comfort zone and yeah this song kind of just came together within a matter of like a couple days that approach to uh making music which is just like have fun and be free with it is uh is really conducive to something interesting and, and a good song so to just dive into the goo lagoon I love the sound design. Everyone loves the sound design, of course, because it's an 85 song. So the main bass in the drop, what, what, what's going on with that? I have to preface. So this is all audio. So this entire thing right here is something that I recorded, I think, a couple years ago at this point. I was fooling around in FL Studio. I'm running a Mac, so I was like using my Windows partition to... Uh, Cool around in FL Studio. And I decided to just record out this long, I think it's like about four minutes worth of me screwing around in Parmer into Vocadex. Yeah, so this is the original stem. Yeah, so it's just uh, it's just me putting Harmer through Vocadex and then just tweaking a bunch of stuff in Vocadex, really. I have really started enjoying going into a session with having no goal other than just to experiment with sound design. And this was this was one of those cases. And uh, it's, it's fun to just like make a new track and, and route the uh, audio of your of your MIDI to the, the new audio track and just record and then just, you know, experiment and just like go all out on just weird stuff. You know, after you record like not even like a minute's worth and you can find some really really cool, sick gold in the audio that you recorded. So that's pretty much what I did with this. I, I wanted something like weird and slimy in this audio stem. And so I just started going through and I retuned it so it's in D instead of C. And uh, I just started going through and picking out little little pieces of it and then scrubbing through the audio and then just arranging 
these audio clips over top of a beat. And then I added some dimension expander, some grain shifting with the Ubic G, which is a super cool plugin, by the way. Ubic G, I've never heard of that. It's considered a, a grain shifter. And, and what that does is a grain based pitch shifter. It takes the audio and you can assign your grain size, which is how small it cuts up the audio. And then you can transpose those individual grains independently. And the cool thing is the smaller your grains here, I'll, I'll, I'll give an example. I only have it in some sections automated in some sections. So like this ringing sound right here is actually the grain shifter doing its work. So if I adjust the scale, you can, you'll be able to hear what it's doing. If I adjust the grain size, um, you can get some really sick effects like this. Just really trippy and gooey and yeah, weird. That's the Yuhi plugin, the same makers as Zebra and Diva. So yeah, I, I use that sparingly here and there just to get that cool like ringing sound. And then I have like an auto filter doing some low passing. And then how I got the movement in the bass and in, in the second part of the drop is really just a, it's really just a simple auto pan with uh, the amount automated. adds an extra trippy layer. I have serum effects, so without it. Okay, so it looks like I have a bunch of different filters and stuff macroed. That's in this section. Yeah, pretty much both. Basically, that was gonna be my next question is how you did that, but okay, you did it through serum effects. Yeah, so uh, it looks like I modulated a bunch of, right here I have a an inverted comb filter and I mapped the resonance to the macro and then I used the dimension expander and then the hyper thing. I don't really know what the yeah. technical term for it is. I mapped that to the macro and pretty much I just mapped a bunch of different effects to the macro. And then when I turn the macro knob, it just, it just does all those things at once and it sounds really cool. So like... As you can see, it gets that really metallic-y effect. And then after that, I have a high-pass macro, resonant high-pass macro, and then uh, just a ton of compression <laughs> and some uh, high shelving. Last week, when we had Evoke on, he was saying that he doesn't do the technique that you're talking about here, which is you go in and, and you do this gnarly sound design and then you render it out for could be a minute, four minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, you know, however you long you want. Then you go and you take that audio file, bring it in, and then you find little pieces that you like and you sequence it, which is what you did here. The reason why, if he finds a part in that big rendered out piece that he likes, he can't go back and tweak that part to make a variation of that. So, I completely understand that. Okay. That's actually something that for most of my production career, like I didn't like to do. I like to keep everything in MIDI so I can adjust the synths and like I, I can adjust the original source sound if I want to change it later or like change the notes around or something. That's totally valid. Sometimes I still do that. I mean, in Arise, for example, like most of that is still MIDI. Although I, I find that working with audio, it's sort of like a destructive way of editing because it's like once you render something down from MIDI, you can't go back. I find that there's inherent value in that limitation. And that is also something that can induce more creativity and thinking outside the box. Because like, yeah, this this whole audio stem is just like a couple minutes of just like C0. I'm just playing C0 and just like tweaking a bunch of stuff. And if I want to change the note, you know, I, I can transpose it, but I'm at the mercy of like different warp algorithms. And I'm never going to get that exact same sound that when I recorded it, uh, I, I'm never going to get that back. I find that it's it makes it a challenge to like make something like that work in just audio. And not to mention, because it's in audio frees your CPU up from overloading and, and extensive processing from like synthesis and effects and stuff, which then allows you to add more effects and stuff to just make it even more weird. And like I said, the whole goal of this song was to just like make something weird and trippy and outside the box, outside of my comfort zone. It kind of seemed to make sense to see what I could do with just cut up audio and throwing a whole bunch of effects on it. In, in terms of all those bass audio clips and the dynamics, so it, it looks quite dynamic in, in terms of the audio you recorded. How are you approaching the dynamics? Are you then flattening it out? 
quite heavily or leaving it quite? Yeah, so I, I use this multiband dynamics preset called Flatline, which is it's sort of like OTT, but it basically is just, it's two bands and the cutoff is at 100 hertz. And so basically everything above 100 hertz is being squashed in, intensely with a lot of upward compression. As you can see, like the upward band is like fully compressed, like it's, it's limited, which means any sound quieter than this threshold that I set is actually going to be pushed up so it's just as loud as as everything else. I think it's in the very first part of the track. I actually think it's in the first quote unquote drop where I don't know if it's a snap or a clare or wow, <laughs> a snare or a clap or what it is, but it sounds crazy wide, like super, super, super wide. It's uh, three layers. This one snare, which uh, is synthesized. It's not really a snare. Um, it's just uh, three operators that are layered together. Actually, this one is just one operator. Yeah, it's just a really short sine wave with a, that's very saturated with a pitch envelope on it. And then I layered that with this snare sample. I'm not really sure. Ooh. Ooh, that gives it that that gives it a lot of tonality. It sounds like I have a resonant high pass filter with an envelope on it. So this is what it sounds like without the filter. But when I add the filter to it, turn up the resonance and then set the filter envelope to the right settings. It gives it a very nice like sound. And if I adjust the filter envelope, like if I turn up the decay, you can hear like you, you should be able to hear the filter actually sweeping. And I go over this in one of my tutorials of how to make really punchy drums. Then the last layer is an 808 clap. And I always find an 808 clap with a ton of reverb on it. A really good ambience layer. Because here's what it sounds like without the clap. And then with the clap, it just, I don't know, it just you get a much bigger sense of, of the snare. It just sounds much fuller and more lush. I have a glue compressor to enhance the transients and limit it. And then I have an EQ that's uh, boosting some of the really high highs and then the body. So here's what it sounds like without compressor or EQ a little weak with the compressor and then with the EQ. I see that you're using the, the FabFilter Pro R, which is awesome. It's so underrated. It's such a good thing. Did, have you found a lot of success with that? Actually, very rarely use this. I think I was just compelled to, like I said, I was compelled to just like try new stuff and try new plugins. Decided to go outside of my usual like Ableton reverb routine and just, uh, yeah, use a different kind of reverb. But Pro R is really cool because the yellow is the EQ and the blue is the decay rate. So basically what that means is like if I boost this, it's not going to make this frequency louder as if an EQ would. It would it's going to make this frequency range longer. It's going to it's going to give it a longer decay. So or I can like really hone in on specific frequencies that I want to decay really long or I can cut them, make them shorter. And then and then with the EQ at the bottom, then I can really fine tune just the reverb itself, not the dry signal. So that would be essentially if I created an effect rack, which had 100% wet reverb on one of the chains and then just a dry signal on the other chain, and then just EQ'd the wet signal, just EQ'd the reverb signal. So that's equivalent to what this would be doing. It's just affecting the, the reverb part of it. It's not affecting the dry signal. So yeah, it's a, it's a really versatile reverb, which I should probably use more because it's really dope. For sound design purposes, I feel like it'd be amazing because you could create a, a comb filter inside of that, both with, with the EQ and with the decay time, and then automate those over time. You, Ooh, know, what, you know what I that mean? That would be cool. Yeah, yeah like a whole, have like a whole bunch of notches and yeah. then just macro all of them together. That's a really cool idea. I like yeah. that idea. Cool. Let me try that. Yeah, so I suppose it's still technically it's still on that snare sound. So how are you approaching the compression? Are you limiting or is that OTT doing most of the... OTT is off. It's not doing anything. But the glue compressor, I have it set to the attack set to three milliseconds and the release set to just as low as possible. And the ratio is set all the way up. And what that's really doing is it's basically limiting everything except the three milliseconds of, of the transient. Then when I turn the threshold down, the makeup gain up, it's just completely squashing the snare. It's limiting it, but it's leaving three milliseconds of that transient through. And then when I turn the soft clip mode on, what that does is it's actually, it limits it, but it's not limiting it as like a limiter or a compressor would do. It's, it's limiting it by just clipping the transient completely. And that gives it a much snappier, punchier transient without red line. 
lining because uh, it's clipping it. It's not going over zero dB. Awesome. So, that, so that's like for those who may not have seen it, if, if you imagine it visually, you're doing almost like distortion to the first few milliseconds of the snare. Then the rest yeah. of it's just limited like normal. Exactly. Yeah. I, I really enjoy using the glue compressor because it, it's like a compressor and a saturator all in one because of the soft clip thing. I can take any sound and I can transient shape it by adjusting the attack time and see how long of a transient that I want. And then by turning the soft clip on, it clips the top of the transient, giving a very snappy effect, which is also something that I go over in my uh, snare tutorial, my drum synthesis tutorial. I've never seen anyone else use Dispersive before, um, which is a really uh, obscure but cool all pass filter, if I remember correctly. Is that right? Yes. I'm only using it twice. I'm using it in the very beginning and the very end on the kick drum. It's only affecting the kick drum, even though it's on the entire track. So Dispersor is an all pass filter, which means as opposed to like a, a filter, like a low pass or high pass that adjusts the amplitude of the frequency, it adjusts the phase response of the frequency. So what it's doing is wherever my crossover frequency is, all of the frequencies below it are being delayed from the high frequencies. And what that does is it, particularly with drums, it's really cool because you can take like a kick drum that's just kind of like a thud and turn it into a very elongated sweeping sounding kick. And I think that's what I'm doing here. So here's the intro kick with nothing on it. It's also low pass. Um, but if I turn Dispersor on, it turns more into like a boom, like a boom instead of just like a thud. I just like to use it to make kicks longer and more like, yeah, less study. On the glue compressor, do you have oversampling mode on? I don't know. No, I don't. So the oversampling I, mode, Jerry was talking about it. It was the episode before your last episode, but he was talking about it. And basically, so when you put oversampling on and you turn the soft clip on, like what you have, you can then use the glue compressor as it's this like nice little gentle spot between a compressor and a limiter. But what it does is it, it sees the sound that's going through it. It sees where the peak is and where the RMS is, and it shortens that so that they're closer together so that it actually gets louder without getting louder. Does that make oh, sense? Oh, yeah. I see. I, I did not even know if this had that. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a cool little trick. And increases the perceived loudness yeah, without yeah. increasing the gain exactly it's still, it's still limiting it in the same at the same level but it's making the perceived loudness more that's yeah. cool i know that the eqs have oversampling but i didn't realize that that did i wonder what else has over dynamic tube has it also strangely you know the sampler that has a higher interpolation quality setting because when i sample something in a sampler and go really high i'll get like aliasing artifacts i'm assuming that would like take care of that yeah almost certainly yeah at a minute and 36, the main bass sound that we were looking at earlier all of a sudden takes on a whole new type of texture. Oh, this sound right here, the zipper, quite a few people have been asking about. This is an interesting sound, and I actually got this idea from something that Evoke showed me last year in, in, in one of his in one of his old songs. And I thought, huh, that's a really cool technique. I'm gonna experiment with that. It's actually really simple. It is a composite of three tracks. One is muted and the other two are the main sound and then a sub. The original sound sounds like this. It's just an obnoxious FM square sound. And then what I do is I, I put a vocoder on it and I, so I assign the carrier signal from a track that is uh, above it, which is sounds, which sounds like this. It's a saw wave that pitches down and pitches up. It sounds like this. And then when I combine them together using the vocoder, it sounds like, well, I have some automations going on, but without any of the automations, it sounds like this. I can't really explain why it sounds like that. Oh, it's because I have the gate all the way down. So without the, without the gate, it sounds like this. Which is pretty much just like a saw. It pretty much just sounds like the original sound, but a little bit thicker. Pretty much sounds like that, but just like with extra filtering and stuff in it. And so I, I turned the gate on the vocoder up to the point where only some of the bands are coming through and it gives it this wetter sound. And then I am modulating the bandwidth of the all of these filters. So in the vocoder, basically how it works is you have a bunch of different bands, which you can choose how many bands are, are there. You can go from four to 40 bands. And each band is pretty much just like a very narrow bandpass filter. And what it's doing is it's filtering the incoming signal, but it is using an external audio source, in this case, the zipper modulator, as the carrier. 
and then it's using the track that it's on as the modulator. I have these names mixed up, That's sorry. Okay. And what it's doing is it's 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 listening for what it's what is coming into it, and it is affecting the original sound. It's basically EQ matching using these bandpass filters the original sound. It's imposing the frequency content of the original sound onto whatever sound the track is on using bandpass filters. And the cool thing about that is you can then use the formant to shift the entire frequency spectrum and also use the bandwidth to really adjust the resonance of each one of those bandpass filters. And by using those in conjunction, I was able to get this really cool ringy metallic sound. If I'm just modulating the bandwidth, it sounds like this. This really like belly metallic weird sound. And then when I am modulating the formant, it basically transposes all of these frequency bands, the frequencies of each one of these bandpass filters. And it sounds like this. By having both of those move in conjunction, it sounds like this. I don't really know how to articulate what that sound sounds like. It's weird. It's zippery and it's yeah. metallic. I have Serum Effects on, which is, I think, just... Yeah, I have this LFO that's just free running that is modulating the mix of the, the hyper dimension effect, just making it wider uh, in certain sections and adding more movement to it and then multiband compressing it. And then, oh, I also have a uh, positive comb filter on it, which reintroduces the fundamental tone back into the sound. So without it, it sounds like this. <laughs> But when I start to add it back in and start to bring up the resonance, you'll be able to hear that it sounds more tonal. And I just add a little bit of resonance to that just to make it sound more expansive and more tonal. Is that an unusually wide monitor, do I see? This is a 21 by 9 ultra wide display. I forget how many inches it is, but it's like, it's like. It's pretty big, <laughs> but it's it's great, especially for Ableton. I'm actually using this. This resolution right now is actually at half resolution. So if I had it full resolution, everything would be twice as small and there would be twice as much space or like four times as much space. It's really convenient to be, arrange and, and compose and do all this stuff in Ableton just because I have so it's just I just have so much space. It fills up my, my field of view very nicely. And I'm not like I don't feel like I'm constrained in this little box. It cures the tunnel vision that I normally get from working in giant projects on regular sized monitors. You ever watch Andrew Huang? Yes, yeah. I just recently started watching uh, watching cool. his videos. Did you see the thing that he put about AIs making music? No. I guess Google hit him up. So he talks about this. I don't know if it's like a plugin or how it works, but basically it's an AI. And what you do is you say, I have this sound and I have this sound. Combine them together, make them something cool. So it's like the vocoding kind of like combining two sounds, but I guess it does it differently, question mark. It was really cool in the video. He's like, this is a flute, this is a guitar. Now this is what they sound like when we combine them. What I'm thinking for you, this would be really, really cool if you could go get that too, because you could be like, this is an 85 bass and this is an 85 bass. And now, oh man, you know, like the 85 bass. It could be something really cool to look into. Dude, actually, I think I know what you're talking about. I haven't seen the video that you're referring to. Just like the other week, and I've known about this for a long Long time, although I haven't really experimented with it. There is this plugin that is called Morph, and it's made by Zynaptic. I think I have it downloaded, but I never installed it. And basically, what it does is what you said. It takes two different sources of audio, and it combines them in such a way that a vocoder does. It uses FFT synthesis or FFT resynthesis, which is sort of like a vocoder, but like with way, way, way more bands and without any like phase issues that you get with the bands in, in a vocoder. Just listening to the demo sounds that they have for the plugin and it's ridiculous. I need to install that. It's one, one of my favorite plugins, that one, just because it makes sounds you literally can't make in any other way. You played oh, you, with it? You I didn't know you had that. that. Yeah, it's really cool. You can do things like, if you have like a percussion loop and then like something like a white noise riser, weird combination of percussive noise kind of moving about in a really strange way. It's just a whole different way of making sounds, which is an awful lot of fun. Why, what you said about combining two different bases, like I need to try that.
So any anyone listening, you may hear this in my future songs. Are you doing that same gated sidechain compression thing you did last time or more normal sidechain on that sidechain bus? Yeah, I'm actually using Volume Shaper, which is pretty much just like the same thing that I do nowadays. This was, I think, right before I figured out how to do the same thing in Serum. Using Serum FX, I mean, uh, which I have a tutorial on. Basically, it's a MIDI triggered amplitude reduction curve that is serving as my sidechain compression effect. Nowadays, I, I use serum effects to do that. I have more control over it than a gate. And that's just kind of what I was looking for for this song. How did you go about composing the song melodically? How I arranged the whole song, I'm pretty sure what I did first was created this drop. I kind of wrote it in reverse. So I made the drop and then I made a rise for it. And then I made the intro for it. Melodically, it was just I heard this weird chord progression, a major chord and then like major chord a half step up. And I just thought that that was a really cool, interesting, trippy chord progression that I that I don't think I've ever used before. I was trying to make something outside the box. And this part over here, after the first section. And then I, and then I introduced this, uh, this string pluck sound. And honestly, this melody right here was just something that I heard in my head as I was listening to this chord progression. And oftentimes I find when I'm listening to chords and there's like a lot of noise or just a lot of movement or maybe even just like noise around me, like in my actual studio or oftentimes in the shower, this phenomenon happens where I'm hearing something in my head and then just the ambient noise and randomness will trick my brain into thinking that there's actually something harmonic or cohesive there when there's actually not. And a lot of times I hear melodies and chord progressions and, and just weird stuff that sounds musical that is not musical at all. It's just from the randomness. My brain tries to make sense of it. I think this was one of those times where I was just listening to this chord progression. I was listening to just random noise around me in my studio. I just heard a bit of this melody and I sequenced it in. It just kind of wrote itself. I just kind of let the muse speak through me. I wasn't really think, overthinking any, anything. G giving myself no limitations as far as like composition goes. The first thing that comes to mind, I'm like, maybe that's worthy of writing down. Maybe that's worthy of, of sequencing in and just seeing where it goes. And pretty much when, I, when I'm in that flow state, at, at this part of the song, I, I, I was in enough of a flow to where I felt like I could take anything, like any random little thing and it would have a life of its own and I just have to not dismiss it like a lot of times I do when I'm, when I'm making something with limitations and a set goal it's like there are a lot of things that I will filter out I'm just like no that's not going to work it's, it's not even worthy to, to put down but for this song it was like anything goes and so I listened to the, the most subtle random thing that came into my brain and put it down and see where it went from there and turns into something cool so what you're talking about right now I've done before especially with driving because the same, same concept with you is that like you have these noises that are going on around you what I like to do is I like to put music on, but I like to put music on low. So all of a sudden, like my brain starts making up, thinks thinks it's hearing melodies, right? But the melodies aren't really there, or like the things aren't really there. And then you know, obviously, if you turn up the music, you're like, whoa, well, that, that, that wasn't even there, you know? It's pure inspiration. Exactly. Yeah, that's one of the things I was going to mention. When you listen to something really low, your brain wants to. Fill in. It's equivalent to looking at like a picture or something in very dim light, or like even someone's face in really dim light. It's like you can kind of make out what you're seeing, but your brain tries to fill in the blanks. And then oftentimes it will look completely different than if it's fully exposed with light. Same thing with, with sound. It's like when you turn the sound down, it's like dimming the song or yeah. dimming what you're hearing and letting your brain fill in the blanks. I saw you do something really cool with the arpeggiator, automating the right. Yeah. So yeah, this is um this is also something that just came came to mind. I was like this needs some kind of weird movement that's rhythmic but not like synced to the beat. I took these chords from the strings and I, I threw them on top of an operator which sounds like this. Just little sine wave plucks. I, I put an arpeggiator on it and set it to uh up, down, and then I set it to free running instead of sync. The rate is in milliseconds instead of notes. Automated that up and down, arpeggiating faster and slower. 
And as it slows down, I have a, a redux effect on it on soft mode. And I turn up the downsampling as the sound gets slower and then I turn it back up. So it's... And the cool thing about the bit, the the redox effect is if you put it on like a very soft sound or a, so a sound that doesn't have a lot of high harmonics, such as like a sine wave, like this is just a sine wave, it will introduce inharmonic harmonics into the sound, inharmonic overtones into the sound, and it sounds like a it sounds like a bell. It sounds like a morphing bell that's like changing size as it's like slowing down, and and then I have the hollow room and then ping pong delay to just like really make it like an ambient sound instead of it just like a just like a plucky effect. So here's what it sounds like without any of the effects. Here's what it sounds like with just the arpeggiator and a sine wave. It's just super basic. And then I add the redux. And then do anything. And then the hollow room. And ping pong. And EQ to make it sound more mid rangey. I know that you have a tutorial on this and we talked about this, but for those who missed the last episode of In the Daw that we did with you, what did you do in this song to make your drums just so freaking punchy? The main thing, I think, like I discussed before in, in Arise, is by using a type of sidechain compression that isn't actually compression. In Arise, I was using a, a gate, which allows you to have much more drastic. Every drum that hits, every instrument is being completely silenced. And then the gain is then being brought back up to normal level very quickly. But in this case, like I, like I said, I'm, I'm using a volume shaper and it's doing the same things. There is just complete silence and then it just gets brought up very quickly. And what, that's, what that does is every time a drum hits, everything mutes and it gives the effect that the drums are punchier than they really are. So like if I mute this, I'm curious to hear how weak this sounds without, without the side chain. I'll start from the drop. Still kind of punchy, but versus this. It just leaves room for the drums to punch through. But as far as the actual drum synthesis goes, or the drum processing goes, so this kick is a kick that I made with Kick2, which is a super cool plugin. It's a kick drum synthesizer, and it allows you to very precisely shape a sine wave sweep and layer it with noise. In this case, I'm using one of its uh, stock click samples, which is the house click. It's just that layered over top of this. Combined, it sounds really thick. The kick is pretty much just like a thud. Its lowest frequency that it hits is 37 hertz, which is super deep. If you're using like a sub pack, you'll be able to feel it goes extremely low. One thing that I figured out to make punchy sounding kicks that are also very subby is to create, if you use kick two, or you can do this with operator too. I discussed this in my punchy drums tutorial with operator is to pick a frequency that you want kind of as like your resonant frequency or your the body of your kick. In this case, around 94 hertz was uh, was the frequency I was looking for. Instead of using an EQ to boost that frequency, if you create a node there and then kind of extend this pitch curve out so it kind of hangs on here for a bit longer before it sweeps down to the, the lowest frequency, it will give it more of a punch in that frequency as opposed to using like an EQ. You could do it with an EQ, although you're going to get phasing issues, especially if you're dealing with frequencies that are that low. It could sound like it extends the, the actual sample longer. But this way, doing it just in synthesis, I'll show you the difference. So here's what it sounds like without that little hump, which is still really punchy. But when I add that back in, like here, I'll exaggerate it. It's much more of like a... It's like there's two parts to the kick. There's the sweep that sweeps down to the, the body. And then after that, it goes down to the lowest note, the, the subier, the subier frequencies. And it just gives it a really full rounded sound. And then layered with a little click, you really don't need much. Here's, that's the thing with, with kicks. You don't really need much of a click or a very loud sounding click for it to sound like it's one big thing. Like without it, it sounds low pass, but with it, it's I mean, just dealing with like a basic noise click. It sounds like it's it sounds like an entirely new thing. And we're just talking just a few milliseconds here. Yeah, we're just talking like 36 milliseconds of a of a noise sample. 
lay it on top of that. And that's that's pretty much it for the kick. For the snare, I mean, we we kind of went over the the first snare. The the second snare in this drop, which is different, sounds like uh, sounds like this. And this one snare that I made in a live stream one time, which is pretty much the same principle that I use demonstrating in my punchy drums tutorial with operator. What I do is I synthesize the drum in operator and then uh, I render it to audio and then I will put it in a sampler and then layer it with like the sound of like someone hitting like a metal pot and then tuning that and then creating like a fade in so it so they don't hit at the same time. So only the tail rings out as like this metallic sound and it almost sounds like a very highly like tightly tuned uh, acoustic snare. I should also mention how I am triggering the sidechain since it's not with compression, since I'm not using audio. I am using an external instrument. It's a it's an Ableton instrument that you can put on MIDI tracks and you can route the MIDI to another track. I create an instrument rack and I have the snare producing audio playing through this track. And then I will create a parallel external instrument and that's routing the MIDI to the volume shaper on the sidechain bus. All I gotta do is just select the track that your MIDI effect is on, in this case, Volume Shaper, and then it will automatically route to that effect. Same applies for if you're using Serum Effects, which I show in one of my tutorials, how to sidechain sidechain ducking with Serum Effects. It's the same principle. What one was that plugin, Tantra? This is Tantra, although it, it's in demo mode, so I just decided to not use it at all. I was trying to get some creative ideas with it. This doesn't work. It is a really cool plugin, though. I think it's like a, it's a filter sequencer. I really don't know how to use it. I was just trying to scroll through presets and nothing nothing worked. If you're working on a track and you get a bit stuck, like an idea is not going anywhere exciting, do you have any strategies you typically use to almost like get out of that creative block? Sort of. There's there's one thing that's related to this that I particularly like to use. Usually it's when I am dealing with, when I'm looping something over and over and it just doesn't sound fresh anymore and I can't get any ideas and I don't know how to like push through to the next section. I need to hear it with fresh ears, but I don't have the time to like sleep on it for a couple of days and then come back with fresh ears. And so what I do is I like to put a pitch shifter and I like to use sound shifter pitch. I throw that on my master. It's a waves plugin, by the way. And then I will just transfer pose it just a couple semitones down or up. And for me, I don't know if this will work for everyone, but for me and a few producer friends that I've that I've talked to about this, it, it helps a lot. And so basically you're just transposing the entire song into a different key and it, it tricks your brain into feeling like it's a, it's a different song. So like this song is in D. I'm really just sick of, I've just been hearing it for, for so long. It doesn't sound fresh to me. But if I transpose it up like one semitone, it's, it'll sound like this. Or like up however many semitones I want, I could just I could go all the way up to an octave, uh, up or down. But that like already that sounds way fresher to my ears just because it's in a new key. All of the uh, harmonic relationships are the same, but the the fundamental is just is shifted and sounds really cool. It's very conducive. I'm like writing melodic stuff like chord progressions or or melodies. That this is the main technique that really helps me get out of the loop figuratively and literally. People have been asking you. Uh, questions about how you design certain sounds in this song or what you've done certain things. What questions have people asked you that we haven't asked you yet? You know, I mean, what has been like a common questions about this song that people have asked you? I guess how I made that snare. I don't really know why it sounds so big. I think it's because I'm layering it with uh, an 808 clap with a bunch of reverb on it. Actually, yes. If you listen to the, the drum track, you'll hear that it's the regular snare sound and then it sounds like an even bigger, wider snare. And what I'm doing is I am automating the speaker for the 808 clap. Here's the here's the here's the main snare. And then here's the snare with the 808 clap layered with it. And it just sounds even bigger like as if it couldn't get any bigger. Um, and th yeah, that's just a, an 808 clap with just full full reverb. Layered on top of the snare. It's it just sounds massive. <laughs> At 5 minutes and 3 seconds, there's a whole new type of bass that comes in. And it's really 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 sick. Uh, cool. I'm glad you asked that because that's a cool bass that I wanted to go over. Cool. The the first sound is that's basically the same sound as as from the the intro. Mm -hmm. It's from the same stem. Actually, this is the original stem, the vocal growl jam. This is it's the same principle as as, as the original sound. It's just taking a really big stem, taking out the cool parts with some filtering and stuff. Not too interesting because it's just audio. But the main sound. 
I think you're referring to is this sound. So the original sound is actually made in Razor. So that's the original sound. Let me let me turn off everything else so you can just hear the two oscillators. So it's just a it's just a square wave, and then I have this sync classic wave, which is really just like a saw sync, or actually in this case it's a square sync that is really obnoxiously like squeaking up and down. Then I throw the low pass on. And that kind of tames it and makes it sound more like more plucky and wet. And then I turn a stereo spread on just to make it wide. The real magic happens in this long effects chain. First thing is a high pass macro, which is not really, I don't think I'm actually using much at all. Yeah, I'm only using it over here in this rise over here. Then the next effect is ping pong delay, which I'm only using sparingly. So I have dispersor on here. I throw dispersor on it. And what this is doing is making it sound a little bit more wet and, and stringy and juicy. Without it, it sounds kind of dry. I take out a little bit of the sub because it gets it got really subby. I cut out a little bit of the mids too. So the, the main meat of the sound is serum effects. I have a hyperdimension effect on, so it's so it's sounding wider. So it basically sounds like it has like unison detuning on it. I have this EQ peak just going down. It's just yeah, it's just a peak. The main effect that we've all been waiting for is the flanger filter, the fl the flange plus filter. What I'm doing is I tuned the cutoff to the root note of the key that I'm playing in. So I tuned it to D and then turned up the resonance and it just gave it this this effect. <laughs> And then multiband compression and a little bit of EQing to cut out those mids. And then this thing is, I don't even think I'm using this thing. Oh yeah, I'm using this a little bit over here to get that like watery sound. Uh, I use this thing called Salty Grain, which is, uh, it's sort of like the Ubic G, except it does more than just transposing the, the grains. It also allows you to choose the start position of each one of the grains, and it kind of gives it this watery random effect. I really enjoy using it. It's, it's really cool. So here's what it sounds like without it. Here's what it sounds like with it. Uh, and I also have a chorus on top of that too, making things even more wide and weird sounding. And then uh, top it off with some multiband dynamics. And this little automation right here, this is really just the filter resonance turned all the way up. So it kind of creates like a, a very fast stutter effect. What the flanger filter really is, it's just a very short delay that you can tune to it to a frequency or to a note. So it's just the same signal just delayed over and over and over. And when you turn the resonance up, it's the same thing as the feedback knob on a delay effect. And so if you turn the resonance all the way up, it's just you're just going to get a tone, which is just way too much. So I'm, I'm sure people send you tracks every now and then. So what would you say is the biggest mistake, um, although not there's really ever mistakes as such in music? So assuming that there is such things as a mistake, what would you say the biggest mistake is in yeah tracks people send you? It's hard to pinpoint one specific thing, but there are a few things that I come across often. And that would be from a compositional standpoint, Make sure that you stay in your key signature. I hear a lot of people kind of going outside, trying to use their ear. Just, just stay in your key signature. If you really have to, and if you're using Ableton, you can use the MIDI effects scale, which allows you to basically quantize your notes to a particular key signature. If you are in the same key signature, when you're creating chords, make sure you make your baseline progression first. Start out with your root notes. Uh, don't worry about chords. Just start out with your root notes and make sure that you have a solid sounding baseline progression. And then to build your chords, you want to use your baseline progression as the foundation for building your chords upon. So I would suggest just copying the MIDI over from your bass and then start building triads in the chord progression. So really just like simple major and minor chords. And then you can start, once you have that solid, then you can start adding sevenths and ninths and upper partials and then start doing inversions, which is basically where you are changing the octave uh, and changing the different voicings of the chords, but still retaining those same notes. But it's very important that you have your root notes established first before you start building crazy chords. 
That's one thing that I often hear that's very common. And the second thing is don't produce with anything on your master bus. I oftentimes hear people using excessive multiband compression when they could just be using very simple EQing and simple single band compression. I find that multiband compression should only be used pretty much should only be used as a sound design tool and not to fix a mix unless there are very specific instances such as like such as using like multiband side chaining to create room for vocals for instance if you need to do any multiband compression on the entire mix what i suggest and sometimes what i do what i would suggest uh, like when you're ready to bounce down your song and and master it is to render your groups so i have my drums group effects group synth group and basses group render those all out as audio and then put those audio stems into a new session basically treat those audio stems as if you were to master them. If you have to do multiband compression, do those on your individual stems instead of just throwing multiband on the entire master and then having everything sound squashed. You can hear like drums and basses fighting for, for space. Yeah, do all that in, in a stem session. And then once you are ready to, to master, all you should really have on your master track is just maybe just a very subtle EQ for spectral rebalancing than just a limiter. If you have all, all of your stems properly compressed and, and mixed, you really shouldn't have to do anything on your master bus. That kind of plays into the third thing that I, that I commonly hear. Oftentimes I will hear drums that are much quieter than all of the other instruments, although all of the other instruments are being heavily side-chained to the drums. I find that it is safer to have your drums louder than everything else, than quieter than everything else, because when when it's time for mastering, you can throw a limiter on it and have it take care of the loud drums. You can't really do the reverse with that. You can't make dynamic, punchy drums that are quieter than your instrument by using a limiter or by using compression or expansion or something like that. Always have your drums at the same volume or louder than the rest of your instruments. Those are the three main things that I that I have to say for, for people that are submitting stuff to me and just producers in general. For those who may be a little bit newer to mastering, so the reason why you can you can limit down, say, louder drums than your synths, but not the other way around, is it, simply because if you have your drums louder than everything else, then it will almost always be the drums triggering the limiter. So it's like a much more predictable thing for the limiter to deal with. Whereas if you have the drums quieter than the synths and the percussion and the, the vocal and everything, and sometimes the limiter's reacting to a vocal other times it's reacting to a synth other times a bass and so it's just a much more messy complicated thing for the limiter to try and sort of wrap his head around this question comes from the inspiration that i received from watching star wars have you guys seen star wars yet i have no i think i'm the only one in the world based on talking to my friends and stuff so it's, it's apparently quite good that, that's what everyone says yeah is did you like it Austin? i really did like it yeah there were some moments where i was just kind of speechless the part that like really totally made the movie worth it and this wasn't even the best part of the movie was and this is no there's no spoiler alerts with what i'm talking about so everyone's safe luke kind of like conflicted with stuff and then yoda shows up because luke doesn't want to train ray yoda's like nah man like you need to and whatever but what he says was like absolutely mind-blowing to me because luke doesn't want to ruin ray by teaching her yoda says failure is the best teacher but also the people that we teach will succeed us far beyond anything that we can do. That's apparent in the in the Star Wars film. Obi-Wan had a master and he was able to defeat the person that, that his master wasn't able to. And then Luke was able to defeat the person that Obi-Wan wasn't able to. And then Rey was able to defeat, you, know, you see what I'm saying, so on and so forth. And so my question to you is, the future AU5s, right? We're going deep with this. The future AU5s that are coming from this, what do you want to see from them? How are they going to transcend what you've already done? Don't limit yourself to one genre or one style. Don't get too comfortable and explore something that is beyond the realm of just music too. I personally find it really fulfilling and very inspiring and just what I've discovered throughout just doing like visual art and, and animation. When you combine two different kinds of art, such as like music and like graphic design or like animation or visual art, you're essentially creating like a cohesive, ever evolving world. Um, and I think it would be really awesome for future producers and artists to, whether it be one person doing all of it or whether it be like a collaboration of, of people doing it, is to create a world, create some kind of new world that goes beyond just 
just music or just visual art. I think it would be really cool to see something that is something that is interactive, something that is like four dimensional music, or <laughs> for instance, that's just like a, a concept. Something that's it's that something that's interactive, immersive. There's too much potential, and uh, technology is accelerating so quickly that it's it's hard for me to really visualize what it's going to look like or what it's going to feel like. Not very long from now. Here's my takeaway from what you said. And I know that like this kind of what we're talking about now is usually we save this kind of stuff for behind the DAW, but we don't get AU5 very often, so we might as well use them. Here's what my takeaway from you is, and this happens over time. It's like more technology evolves and everything. The more complete your artistic imagery can become. So like, for example, back in the day, you know, in the beginning days of music, you either sung or you played an instrument. Well, then they evolved to that. Now they can sing and play an instrument. Oh, well, now they evolved from that. Now they can play, sing and play multiple instruments. Now they have other people playing with them. And then they evolved from that. Okay, now that they now they can record with it. Okay, now that they can tweak it. Now they can add instruments. Now you can have as many instruments as you want. Now, you know what I mean? I, what I'm thinking is that like as music technology progresses and everything, keep incorporating because it, it can help you really fulfill the, your artistic vision. But I think if you go outside of music, you can also fulfill your artistic version by combining it with music. For like, for example, and I, I agree with you, how you do the visual elements. You know, I, I I've seen some of your visual elements before, and it's it complements your music so well. It fulfills that music imagery so well. It makes it multi-dimensional at that point. So maybe it is you create a song, you were able to create some really amazing graphic art with it, and you created this really cool pulsating music video with it. Or to me, the more people add to that, add to to art, the more I want to partake of it. And the way that technology is going and everything, it's getting easier and easier and easier and easier and easier to create the products that you want. You can go buy Final Cut Pro for a couple hundred bucks and throw together a cute little video. Is that what you were saying? That's kind of what I got from it. Yeah, no, no, it, it definitely is. Even just in the in the music scene, like we're not at the mercy of major record labels anymore. Mm -hmm. We can release our own stuff and and do far more. You know, the power is in our hands as creators. We are able to utilize things that are really not that far in reach anymore. And it's just a matter of, I guess, perseverance and the drive to teach yourself and do those things. It's not really, we're not really at the mercy of, I mean, huge production studios are always going to be a thing for huge productions, but it doesn't have to be like a corporate type of yeah. thing, like a major record label used to be. I just think this applies for just art in general. The power is in our hands now. And it's kind of our responsibility as artists to be the ones that are not only creating the art and pushing the boundaries, but being the ones that are innovating the entire system as a whole and, and paving the way for other artists to be able to execute their visions in, in better, more practical and, and, and easier ways. That's certainly what I'm looking forward to in the future. In the same way, if you take, say, like live events, I think people underestimate how much scope there is to do something new and different after the experience. And I think you could almost do anything and you, put, you can put music next to it. I mean, virtual reality is becoming such a popular consumer based thing that's n frankly not really that expensive anymore for how impressive it can be. I feel like that's probably the next wave of experiencing music or live music uh, particularly, whether it be like VR helmets in venues and having crazy interactive stuff visually and and orally, as well as from the comfort of your own home experiencing the same kind of thing. We're already having VR music videos fully synthesized 3D sound reactive worlds that you can experience and look around in. That's already a thing. So I think it's just a matter of time for that to become the mainstream. Would you like our feedback on your song? Sure. The song was so cool. I listened to this with my wife in the car one day and we're just like, oh my gosh, like what is going on? This is amazing. <laughs> in an audio sense, you painted a picture so well because you're right, if you took away the name Goo Lagoon, I would still picture something like that, like swampy, outer spacey monsters in the swamp kind of thing. Is that kind of the picture that you were projecting? Yeah, oh, it, t it totally was. Something that was pretty much just like a dank psychedelic forest. There's nothing really in the song that's wrong or that like stood out to me and was like, Ugh. I mean, the only thing that I could really say that I personally think would make it better, quote unquote, is... I love vocals, even if it's just one vocal saying one thing, you're playing all over again. It's, there's just something about vocals that speaks to me. Sometimes it's called for, sometimes it's not. So again, that's an artistic decision. And so that was just my thing. Did you want a vocal in it or are you proud of that it doesn't have a vocal? I actually don't think it crossed my mind to have a vocal in it. The imagery that I had in my head. Do you ever play Zelda or Karina of Time? I haven't. Oh, Austin. I'm sorry. It's okay. It's all right. Forgiveness is a real thing. There's this part in the game, right, where it's like, 
it's this swampy part. I guess it's not really swampy. It's more of a watery part. So I'm closing my eyes. I'm, I'm picturing it right now. It's like this watery part. There's like these these fish people, right? And they like they speak this really weird language. And so what I was thinking would be really really cool, since this is like super psychedelic, is basically having like this incomprehensible voice that that's like alien, but like it's still like you can tell it's a voice, but it's saying things, adding to the psychedelic trip. Yeah, it totally does. That is definitely something that could be added to this. An example of what I'm talking about. Have you heard the song? It's by Bass Nectar and AT Aliens. It just barely came out. Have you heard that song? There's a part in the drop where like, they, I think they took this Jamaican vocal and I sped it up really quick. And it's, it's exactly what you're saying. Like you can tell it's a vocal, but it's like, it becomes more of like a rhythmic instrument at that point. It's just really cool. Something that we learned from Sci-Fi when he came on, uh, when he was talking about his Totality album, which by the way, your remix of that is insane with Ecotone. <laughs> that was amazing. When he was talking about that, I asked him how he got his drum so punchy on that. He uses a plugin from Voxango called LF Punch. You ever heard that before? Oh yeah, LF Max Punch. I actually think I have that on the master of here. Oh, yeah, dude. it's bypassed though. I enjoy that plugin. That's lot. good. Okay, okay. So for the people who haven't seen it, if you didn't see the sci-fi episode, highly encourage you to go check it out. But on there, he talks about using it and it really creates just like some extra punch to it. And it's, it's interesting that you're using it on your master. Why, why do you put it on your master? This master is a variation of the shock diamond mastering chain. I find that it it introduces like really nice low harmonics. It's basically like a like a low frequency saturator with a filter. It reintroduces really low harmonics that you may not be able to hear on some systems that don't have really low sub without the help of some harmonic excitation in the low end. And this I find kind of just fills out those fills out that low s- scoop between the your low mids and the sub that um, oftentimes just goes missing. You are also able to uh, compress with it too. So it has a drive which saturates it and you can also compress it. So this is a cool technique that I've I've been using. It was one of the cymatics packs, right? I was going through my presets the other day and I think it was like slugs or vomit or something like that. Very snails kind of stuff, gritty. And, and I didn't really like them, to be honest. They, they just weren't really my style. But I found something, I found a trick, and now I've been applying it to other presets and it's yielded some really, really cool results. If you're in the key of F, most of the time when I'm looking at bass sounds, I play like F1 or F0, maybe F2, mm-hmm. just to see what it sounds like. Try playing like F negative four. Go clear down there. The reason why is because no longer is it, you know, are you focusing on the tonal part of it? It actually evokes some really interesting percussive rhythmic elements still maintaining some some tonal value though it's have you ever have you ever tried that before occasionally i've tried that that's usually territory that i i'm not compelled to explore just because it's it's sub frequency stuff it's, it's sub tonal stuff mm-hmm. rather but that is a that is a really cool idea though because there are i know what you mean there are a lot of bases that i even i have that f- almost sound better not as bases as just like organic textures yeah. or like glitchy textures you know what i mean that's yeah. definitely something i'm, I'm i should experiment with Good with stuff. my own sounds because I, ha- I haven't really because i'm always trying to make sounds sound design stuff that's based on tones exactly and not really not so much like i mean textural tones but not not exclusively textures yeah i kind of call them sub sub frequencies or, or sub sub notes you get some really really cool results so if you take say the i can has kick wavetable play it like three or four octaves down and then do like an octave pitch envelope yeah it's kind of yeah just like, it's, it's more of like a rhythmic texture thing but it's yeah it's super super cool the i can yeah. has kick wavetable is is super crucial i'm so glad that it exists Definitely. it's it's actually much like um what dispersor does on uh, saw waves so for those wanting to say make similar wavetables to ICANN has kick because uh, it is, is one of the most popular wavetables in serum at least in some genres you can get the at least the first cycle going by going to the wavetable editor and then doing load a single cycle so if you do that and then load up a kick in there and then do some warping you can basically create those same sort of vibe as ICANN has kick but with a different initial kick if that makes sense yeah that, that makes sense because the wavetable is pretty much just like a very fast sine wave sweep and then yeah so I suppose yeah finally just yeah de- definitely get morph installed because it is as I say one of my favorite plugins because it it genuinely makes sounds you can't really make in any other way which I think is pretty cool do you have a good time do you like coming back on the show dude oh absolutely <laughs>